Good afternoon, everyone. It is my honor and privilege to introduce today's distinguished and special speaker, His Excellency Ambassador Oh Jun. I believe many of you already know about him through his recent impressive speech at UN Security Council debate. But much prior to that event, he has been responsible for a representative of Korea. So I know that this will be very long introduction for his many experiences, but I'm going to make this very brief. Ambassador Oh Jun is a Korea diplomat who has served the Republic of Korea in various posts. He was appointed as ambassador and permanent representative of Korea to the United Nations in 2013. He currently served as the president of the Economic and Social Council and as the president-elect of the Conference of State Parties to the Convention on the Rights on Persons with Disabilities from the 2015 to 2016 term. Prior to this position, Ambassador Oh served as chairman of the United Nations Disarmament Commission, in addition to representing the Republic of Korea in many meetings of UN bodies. During the Korean presidency of the 56th session of the UN General Assembly from 2001 to 2002, he worked in the president office as deputy chef of the cabinet. In academically, he received a master's degree in international policy studies from Stanford University, a diploma in international and comparative politics from the London School of Economics and Political Science, and a bachelor's in French literature from Seoul National University. He was a visiting scholar at the Hoover Uni Institution at Stanford University and a member of the Korea Agenda Council of the World Economic Forum. So now, without further ado, please welcoming him with a big applause. Miyazaki-san, the computer will turn. I can pull it out and show you. Because I don't know which page it is. Yes. 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 파워가 없어요? 아, 그럼 돌려만 놓으세요. 네, well, good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, good afternoon. It's uh, uh, very nice to be back here. I think I... Uh, was here last time about 10 years ago. Uh, of course, different students. Uh, the same professor, actually, Professor Hong Ki Jun, was uh, already here. I think I gave uh, another lecture uh, to the students that time. I don't know about what, but anyway, I gave a lecture. So this time, um, coming back to this campus, this beautiful campus, uh, 10 years on, uh, I am very happy to meet all of you. Uh, I know that you are uh, studying here in a, in a very good environment. Uh, we, we joked about how it must, be, uh, it must be difficult to study inside when you have a beautiful flowers blooming outside uh, when it's spring. But it's not a spring, so flowers are not there. Um, well, the topic I would like to uh, talk about today is uh, I entitled it The World, the UN, and North Korea. Uh, these days, wherever I go, I have to speak about a little about North Korea because a lot of people, uh, a lot of people saw my speech in the UN Security Council on. North Korea and human rights issue, and they keep asking me uh, questions like uh, how I uh, how I uh, spoke about this issue uh, in such a uh, 
such an impactful way uh, where I didn't intend it that way, but uh, anyway, that's how it was uh, received by many people. And I'm, I'm glad that because uh, I'm happy about that because especially young people seem to be more interested in issues like the United Nations or, the, or North Korea or the division of Korean Peninsula, uh, separated families, all of which are important issues, but usually we, uh, we forget about them in our daily life. So I'm glad that if I was able to remind the uh, younger generation of the importance of those issues. Uh, let me... Uh, Let me uh, lead you through. Yeah. Oh. Let me lead you through uh, the PowerPoint. This PowerPoint has a lot of a uh, uh, lot of photos, not too many words, so it's going to be not too boring. I hope. Let me uh, ask you a question like this: You know, when you think of the United Nations, what? first comes to your mind? Anyone would like to say anything? Yeah? World peace. Yeah, good. Anything else? Humanitarian, yeah, that's a very important part of the UN's work. Well, some people uh, think of the UN headquarters building in New York City. I I go there every day, either to meet people or to attend a meeting. But uh, some of you must have been there. Or some others, if you haven't been there yet, probably you have a plan to visit the UN headquarters building one day. Uh, I think it's worth visiting. We are all proud of uh, UN Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. Uh, who has been in service there for eight years, and he has uh, uh, he has uh, the remainder of his term until uh, the end of next year. And, he, and I think he's doing a great job. Well, someone told me about world peace. These are what he call uh, blue helmet soldiers, who are usually uh, UN peacekeepers. They all wear those blue helmets uh, with uh, the UN logo. Someone is a humanitarian, so here you go, UNHCR, and a lot of uh, humanitarian work by the United Nations. And this is the UN General Assembly Hall, where the leaders of the world meet every year, uh, usually in September, and they deliver their speeches, so, the, so a lot of people probably have seen one of these, uh, uh, you know, meetings, leaders' meetings. This is also a well-known place in the United Nations, which is the Security Council Chamber. Um, it has been there, the, the same, same shape, same decoration, at least for several decades. A lot of people are familiar with this image. This is me speaking at the uh, UN Security Council meeting uh, last December on North Korean uh, human rights. So we have seen all these uh, different aspects of the United Nations, which all of which are, in my opinion, relevant. Because the UN is doing a lot of, uh, UN is dealing with a lot of issues in the world. Actually, to put it simply, I think the UN is uh, dealing with all the problems in the world. That's what the United Nations is supposed to do. Then what kind of problems do we have in the world? We have a lot of problems, but from the perspective of the United Nations, there are basically three important categories of problems. What are they? 
First, we fight instead of living in peace. Why do we fight? Well, humanity, human beings have been fighting with each other for a long time in our history. We all need to eat. We are all animals and we all need to eat. So in, in the long past, humans fought for food. And then when we uh, started to have uh, country, states, humanity uh, started to fight for wealth, for land. And more recently, uh, we fight for religion. You know, people have different religions, and usually, instead of uh, uh, respecting others' religions, instead of uh, uh, understanding others' religions, we fight because we want other people to respect our religion. That's probably we fight for religion. And more recently, we, we fight for ideologies, like communism. What is ideology? Ideology is uh, our belief about how we should live or how our society should be like, how our country should be like. So people can have different ideas about what our society should be like. But just like religion, instead of uh, respecting others' ideas about society, we fight because we believe our ideas are better than others. So we want our ideology to prevail. So we fight for ideology, right? Well, when you fight, you, need, you better fight well because you need to win. If you lose a war, a fight, what happens? Then you die, right? You are killed. Not only you, but your family members and your friends, they, they, they are also at the risk of uh, being killed or being captured. In the, in the past, uh, they become slaves. So you don't want them to happen. So you better fight well. How do you fight well? You should have good weapons so that you can uh, overpower your enemy. So in the beginning, they uh, started with sword and spears, quite primitive weapons, but because Humans, when they were fighting, they were desperate to develop weapons. So they developed new weapons like guns or cannons. And even later, uh, they developed, we developed uh, fighter jets and missiles. And eventually, we came up with a very powerful weapon, a kind of ultimate weapon which is nuclear weapon, which can wipe out the whole world many times. So people got afraid of that because we have developed two powerful weapons. These weapons kill, can kill all of us many times in a way redundant. So uh, you all know that the Second World War ended with the use of atomic bombs, you know, nuclear weapons. Two bombs, actually, in Japan by the United States. So that ended the last world war. So humanity realized that they, we cannot go on like this. Uh, we need to stop recurrence of a global war that has the potential of uh, wiping out humanity. 
So they decided to create the United Nations to save the succeeding generations from the scourge of war. This is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting the first part of the UN Charter. The UN char Charter, the first part starts with the declaration that we are creating this organization to save future generations from the scourge of war. This, uh, this sculpture is a, a symbol of nonviolence. Actually, this particular uh, sculpture was, uh, uh, was uh, a product of uh, people's uh, consciousness about violence uh, after the famous Beatles singer John Lennon was killed in New York City. Uh, and, you know, so they, so this sculpture, well, I don't know who, who made it, but it was originally in the Central Park, but the government of Luxembourg bought it and donated it to the United Nations. Right now it's in the UN building, UN uh, courts. So the UN, uh, to prevent another uh, war, decided to resort to or employ the concepts of uh, collective security. What is collective security? Collective security is a, a concept in which uh, when any of member states break, uh, break the peace or pose a threat to peace, then all the rest of the member states will unite to stop that particular country or to punish that particular country so that they can always restore peace. This is concept of collective security. So the UN employed the concept of collective security and they pursued disarmament. What is disarmament? Do we, do we fight because we have weapons? Or do we have weapons because we want to fight? What do you think? If we are fighting because we have weapons, then if we get rid of weapons, then we will stop fighting, right? But if we have weapons because we want to fight, then if we don't have weapons, we will fight with whatever is available, right? Well, the truth probably is close to the latter, but at least if you have less number of lethal weapons, then the chances will probably be that even if you want to still fight, uh, you cannot kill others as effectively as when you have more lethal, powerful weapons, right? So if we can reduce the number of lethal, powerful weapons, usually weapons of mass destruction, if we, can, if, we, if we cannot totally get rid of them, if we can reduce the number of these weapons, even if we still go for war, we will probably have less casualties and less, uh, less uh, impacts from the killings. So that's the concept of disarmament. So UN pursues collective security and disarmament. But in reality, um, the, there has never been another global war after the end of Second World War in 1945. During the last 70 years, we never had another world war. That should be a matter of congratulations. But we have had small and medium-sized conflicts, military conflicts. And what is more worrisome is that um, even though the UN pursued the disarmament, the gap 
in military capabilities between uh, militarily advanced powerful countries and uh, weaker countries, the gap between them in their military capabilities has grown. Some countries have really powerful military capabilities while others uh, don't have them. So some groups, usually groups, militant groups, committed to fighting even though they don't have enough military capabilities, started to resort to what they call terrorism. What is terrorism? Terrorism is a indiscriminate killing of people by uh, using, for example, bombs. Sometimes it's in the form of suicide bombs because you want to give others big damage even though you don't have a military capability to overpower the other. So that's what is called terrorism. And 9-11 was the most famous and typical case of new forms of terrorism. Um, so these days, threats from terrorism or violent extremism or even genocide Threats from these, uh, these things are more serious than a threat from traditional war, traditional warfare. We, even though we still have traditional warfare, uh, a lot of uh, problems that uh, break peace in the world today uh, are caused by terrorism, violent extremism, sometimes genocide. The second category of problems we have in the world uh, is poverty. Because many of us are poor and underdeveloped. In fact, one third of the world population, that means more than Two billion people live uh, with uh, under two dollars a day. Uh, two dollars a day means sixty dollars a month. I don't know how much allowance you have, but probably one third of the population in the world live with less money than you use for your monthly allowance. Probably your monthly allowance is larger than $60, right? Uh, maybe, I, I can see that people in this room are quite poor. So. $60 or $300 for month. Anyway, so that's what is happening. In the long past, when humanity, uh, when we uh, lived uh, on, lived as hunters and gatherers, basically we ate whatever we could get. So there was a, there, there, there were not particularly rich people or poor people. When you are eating what you hunt, one together, how can you be rich? You know, uh, you just eat from hand to mouth, and nobody was particularly rich or poor. But when humanity settled down, started farming, they were able to uh, store food and resources. Then who's going to have these stored food and resources? It came a big issue, a very important issue. First, the ruling elite, 
like kings or aristocrats, they have the absolute power in distributing food and resources. So they can have uh, whatever they like to have, and they they gave, uh, they have the uh, authority to distribute wealth among uh, among their people. But when the economic concepts of market, free market, uh, came into being, the distribution of wealth uh, became through more fair, through fairer competition. You know, people started to work and people started to trade what they have with others. So the, the concept of currency, money came in. So it, met, it started to matter how much money you have. Because money can buy you food and resources. And usually, uh, in a more, in a fair way, you know, because this is fair competition and free market. But the gap between the winners and losers of competition became more serious. And eventually, the question of uh, inequality came up because some people got very rich while uh, others were uh, poor. So some people started to believe that if states control distribution of wealth, for themselves, then we might have a fairer society because states can control all the uh, distribution of wealth. But that concept is called communism. But as we know, communism failed. Communism basically failed, largely failed. But some concepts of communism were reflected in uh, in what is called a democrat social democracy or a modified capitalism in the form of uh, state government uh, role in uh, redistribution of wealth or social welfare. Most countries, most democratic countries in the world today have a certain degree of uh, redistribution of wealth, usually through taxation and also social welfare, usually through government spending, including uh, our own country. But despite these efforts, the gap between states and also uh, in a state, the gap between the rich and poor widened. Today, 1% of the world population owns almost half of the whole wealth in the world. So 1% owns half of the whole wealth. And the other 99% also own the other half. The UN uh, is trying to uh, help reduce the gap between the rich and poor by promoting development, which is often called development cooperation. So development is the second pillar of the United Nations. What is the first pillar? I already talked about it. First pillar is peace and security. So the second pillar is development. So the UN is based on the understanding that without people in the world, 
prospering together without people in the world enjoying welfare together. Peace and security cannot be guaranteed because people start to starve, people suffer from poverty, then you necessarily end up with instability. Instability leads to conflicts. So the UN came into being with the belief, like I said, with the belief that we should save the succeeding generations from the scourge of war. But to, to save them from the scourge of war, just uh, using military force and using diplomats, diplomacy to stop conflict is not enough. Because if people are poor, if people cannot enjoy prosperity together, you have this siege of conflict everywhere. So that's why the UN considers development cooperation uh, very important. That's a lot of activities the UN is doing uh, in terms of promoting development in, in uh, developing countries. And this is what is called Millennium Development Goals. In year 2000, they, the UN member states agreed on eight goals to be pursued through 2015, this year. So this year is the last year of Millennium Development Goals. So we need new goals. So in the United Nations, we are now negotiating new goals to be applied from 2016 through 2030. So next 15 years, for the next 15 years, we are now working on new goals. So these are old goals, Millennium Development Goals. The new goals are usually called Sustainable Development Goals. Why are they called Sustainable Development Goals? Because the development, all our competition for development among states is not sustainable. Why is it not sustainable? Because we only have one Earth, the planet Earth. If we contaminate this planet, then we don't have anywhere else to go. And we are already uh, spoiling this planet a lot. So you cannot just uh, keep developing countries without consideration of the environment and climate change. Climate is, is, uh, climate is changing because we have contaminated our environment. This is climate change. So the term sustainable development uh, indicates that any development efforts today need to take into account environmental concern and our efforts to keep the planet uh, sustainable. So that's why it is called Sustainable Development Goals, and we are working on it, working on them. The third category of uh, problems in this world are, have to do with human dignity. People cannot live only, uh, only by eating. We are not animals, so we need something more than eating. So we need the human rights and human dignity. Because humans are a social animal. All our human relations or human dignity should be guaranteed by our relationship 
Robinson Crusoe, who lived in a deserted island, didn't need any human dignity. What kind of dignity do you need if you live alone? Nobody is watching you. Nobody is talking to you. Nobody is violating your human rights. There's, there's no such concept as human dignity if you are all by yourself. Do you still need to, do you still need dignity when, when you live by yourself? What do you think? So all human rights and human dignity have to do with society, where people live together and has to do with relations among people. States are the most powerful institutions humans have ever created. States have the legal authority to put people in jail if they do something wrong. And, and sometimes they can, the state can even put them to death, what is called capital punishment. Other than states, no other institution or no one else can do such thing legally. If you have your children, if your children don't behave, can you put him or her in, in jail or in your room, lock him up? You cannot. Your, your child will call police. Can you put your children to death if they do something wrong? You cannot. You will be arrested by police. Only states can do that. Can you think of any other institutions that can do that legally? Can the United Nations do that? They cannot. So states are the most powerful institutions human beings ever created. In the past, the rulers of a state used to have absolute authority over people's life and death. But the concept of civil society and democracy came in and expanded. Now we all believe in human rights. Human rights according to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, is based on the premise that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. This is, uh, these days, I, th I think everyone just take it, take it as, uh, as it is, take it as granted. But when the concept first came out, it's uh, quite revolutionary concept because until then not everyone was equal you know if you are born into upper class higher class if you are born into a royal family you are different from others who are born to lower class or born as a slave so how can people be equal just, just by birth. That was uh, quite revolutionary. But now, everyone, a lot of people, if not everyone, believe in this concept, right? So this is uh, uh, human rights. And this is the scene from the, the Human Rights Council in Geneva, UN Human Rights Council, and the United Nations, uh, not only Human Rights Council, but General Assembly, and sometimes even the Security Council are making efforts to protect and promote human rights. In the world, uh, the, the efforts to promote human rights uh, made some progress, 
because right now we have about 120 democracies in the world, which is a three-fold increase from 40 countries 40 years ago. So we now have about 60% of all states in the world that are democratic. But still, human rights violations are taking place all over the world. They take place at home, in work, in schools, but most importantly, human rights violations are committed by states. For the reason I already told you, because states are the most powerful institution humans ever created. So states can use force legally. And states are originally supposed to protect their citizens. But states sometimes uh, imprison people, torture people, and sometimes execute people without due procedure. That's what is called human rights violations. And very serious. So all the serious human rights violations are committed by states, governments. This is a scene from genocide, which was committed by Germany, Nazi, Nazi Germany, during the Second World War. Six million Jews were imprisoned and killed just because they are Jews. No other reason. Genocide can take place anywhere, not only the Holocaust. Holocaust is the Jewish genocide during the Second World War. Not only Holocaust, but even, even uh, as recently as 20, 30 years ago, in Cambodia, in Rwanda, millions of people died. Millions of uh, unarmed, innocent citizens were killed for different reasons. So today we have uh, an institution that is devoted to uh, dealing with human rights violations by states. This is called the International Criminal Court. And they basically deal with four categories of crimes. Uh, the crime of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. Now, let us turn our attention to the Korean Peninsula where we live. And basically, I think uh, on the Korean Peninsula, we have the same problems as in the world, but probably in a smaller setting. Same prob problem, problems meaning, I told you, in the world, there are three categories of problems. What was the first one? We fight. What is the second one? Poverty. A lot of people are poor and un undeveloped. What is the third one? Human rights and dignity. We basically have these problems on the Korean Peninsula. On the Korean Peninsula, Koreans, our ancestors, have lived here for thousands of years as one nation. We were divided in the past only once during the Three Kingdom era from uh, one century before Christ and probably until 7th century, so 800 years. There were three kingdoms on the peninsula, Shilla, Hekje, Goguryeo. But three kingdoms were unified by Shilla. Other than that time, we already had one nation. But um, we were divided into two 70 years ago. In the aftermath of the end of Second World War, 
and Korea's independence from Japanese colonial rule. As we know, North Korea uh, became a communist country, and in South Korea, we have a free democratic country. We fought a fratricidal war from 1950 to 53. And North Korea, even after the war, continued to pose a threat to South Korea. But more recently, let's say for the last 20 years, North Korea started to pose a threat not only to South Korea, but to the whole world. How? Because they developed nuclear weapons and long-range missiles. In the world, we have a, a system called NPT, Non-Proliferation Treaty, according to which only five countries in the world can have nuclear weapons legitimately. All others are not supposed to have nuclear weapons, but North Korea was in the NPT, but they declared that they are coming out of the NPT, and they started to develop nuclear weapons, and they conducted three rounds of nuclear bomb tests. So this is a big challenge and threat to the whole world, not only to South Korea. So the UN Security Council, the gentlemen talking to each other there are Chinese and French ambassadors, and the UN Security Council ha has responded to North Korea's provocations by adopting resolutions and imposing sanctions on North Korea every time. In economic terms, the gap between South Korea and North Korea is huge. South Korea's per capita GDP is about 20 times larger than North Korea's, and trade volume of South Korea is about 150 times larger than North Korea's. When you consider that basically we are of the same ethnic group, we, it is surprising or it is uh, mysterious that South Korea and North Korea are taking such a different path. Why do you think it is happening that way? One cannot help but uh, one cannot help but consider the importance of governance. If someone wants to have a test, real life test on the importance of governance for the long term development of a country, the test has already taken place on the Korean Peninsula. During the last 70 years, North Korea and South Korea have had different forms of governance. The North Korean form of governance didn't work while ours worked. So that's why there is such big gap between the two countries. Probably North Korea's uh, best hope might be uh, follow China's path. China opened up society and reformed its economy. And even though China still has a one-party communist rule, politically, China's economy is now uh, impressive. And uh, China is probably, a lot of people think China will even catch up with the US economy in, 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 in due time. So their achievement, at least in the economic area, is really impressive. So if North Korea follows China's steps, they might be able to achieve similar progress. Why they cannot do that? Because no 
Bitcoin storing money. Because if they uh, open up and reform their country, a lot of people in North Korea will probably realize that what they are trying to pursue is uh, to become like China or South Korea, which is very damaging to the sustainability of the North Korean regime. So this is uh, probably a dilemma on the part of North Korean regime. If, to put it simply, what is good for North Korean people and society is not necessarily good for the North Korean regime. Because North Korean regime needs to maintain their control over the country, they maintain their power. So that's why North Korea uh, has developed weapons of mass destruction and they have resorted to the crackdown of their own citizens. And that's how the North Korean human rights human right crisis came into being and was uh, dealt with by the United Nations as the North Korean human rights issue. The UN has dealt with North Korean human rights issue for the last 10 years. But the debate in the UN was brought to a new dimension by a report this gentleman is holding. This gentleman is named Michael Kirby, former Supreme Court Justice of Australia. He led three men, not three men, but one woman, one woman and two men actually. Anyway, three person committee, which was called Commission of Inquiry on North Korean Human Rights. They worked for one year. They, inter they interviewed more than 200 North Korean detectors and they came out with the most thorough and comprehensive report on North Korea ever written which Mr. Kirby is holding in his hand. And this report was saying that the situation, human rights situation in North Korea is so serious that it could constitute a crime against humanity. In the United Nations, using this term, crime against humanity, is very important because earlier I talked about International Criminal Court, and do you still remember the four categories of crimes eligible for ICC? One of them is crime against humanity. So the fact that they describe the North Korean situation as a crime against humanity indicates that the North Korean human rights issue is eligible for the International Criminal Court. And because North Korea is now party to International Criminal Court, the only way of bringing this issue to ICC is through the Security Council. That's why there was a Security Council meeting on December 22 last year, first time in history to discuss North Korean human rights issues. Of course, they didn't decide to bring it to the ICC. In the Security Council, you have China and Russia who are prominent members and who have veto power. So they stopped short of taking any decision on it. But the fact that they adopted North Korean human rights issue on the agenda of the Council was important and I, uh, that was, uh, as it happened, that was the last meeting of Korea, South Korea, on the Security Council and my last duty as a Security Council member was to discuss North Korean human rights. In a way, human rights violations and suffering from human rights violations of our sisters and brothers in the North. Yes, 
I don't know if he has a lot of video clips. Is this a sound from the server? Probably not. Yeah, then, thank you. and thank you for your inspiring lecture today. Actually, I had a chance to work in NGO named um, Korea Society uh, for rehabilitation of persons with disabilities. Actually, it was last winter, so um, honestly, I started to have interest in that issue very recently. So, um, I read some articles which say that North Korea will ratify the UN CRPD by 2016. So it was quite um, surprising to me because that issue about persons with disabilities is quite isolated even in Korea. So I wonder, how do you think, I mean, do you think that ratification of UN CRPD can make any impact to North Korean society or any human rights issues of North Korea? Thank you. Good question, and I'm I'm glad to have that question now. least because right now I'm serving as the president of State Parties Conference for CRPD. CRPD, if you are wondering what it is, CRPD is Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and um, well, the, the the organization you used to work with uh, RI, Rehabilitation International, is one of the important NGOs in the area of uh, uh, the disability community. And there are currently there are about 153 or 4, I'm not sure, 3 or 4 state parties to CRPD. This is quite impressive number considering that CRPD only came into being in 2008. So CRPD is the youngest human rights convention in the world. You know, there, are, there are seven human rights conventions. I don't know if any of you can remember any of them. For example, uh, women, uh, discrimination against women, to, to prevent discrimination against women. Uh, children's rights and uh, uh, prevention of torture all these are one of the seven human rights conventions in the world and the last one the seventh one is CRPD disability because this convention is relatively young seven years in the history of uh, UN is young um, it is impressive that we already have 154 state bodies because the, the, the UN, the number of UN member states, how many are there? 193. So out of 193, 154 is quite a lot, isn't it? So it's a good, uh, a good convention. A lot of countries not particularly devoted to human rights issues are still subscribing to this convention. So I think it would be, uh, would be uh, encouraging if we can have the DPRK, North Korea, to ratify CRPD. Uh, it will probably help North Korea's image as human rights violator, uh, it will help uh, a little in, in their efforts to improve that image. 
it's not going to uh, totally change their image as human rights violator as long as they have a, a political uh, prison camp, as long as they have uh, public executions, as long as they have uh, uh, imprisonment of people without due procedure. All these things need to be uh, addressed, but at the least by uh, ratifying the CRPD, uh, they might be able to improve their image a little. Uh, so that would be welcome if they really go for that. Any other questions? Yeah. I would like to ask you about the oligarchy politics by five permanent member states in the council, in the Security Council. And fortunately, I wrote my term paper last semester, which dealt with the UN Security Council. And I regarded this oligarchy politics as the major limit of this council, council's collective security. And I even mentioned that, in my view, this exceptional status and right enable the oligarchy to govern the council in a way that pleases them to the extent that their interests, the five member states' interests, are more secure than universal values such as human rights. So what do you think about this oligarchy politics? And how can the council, how can the UN system and council overcome this politics, oligarchy politics? So what do you think is a good alternative to what you described as a uh, oligarchy? What, what would be a better uh, security council? Everyone has a equal uh, membership and equal power. That's, that's what you think would be better than now. Yeah, to, this is a very important question, actually. Uh, I think if someone asked me, what is the most important, number one important question in the UN today? I would probably say that the question you asked would be the most important question. Because this is not just uh, about composition of security council. This is about what you think of the future of the United Nations, what you think of the rationale for the existence of the United Nations. We, to consider this, we need to go back to 1945, when they created the United Nations. Before they created the United Nations, before the Second World War, there was another body, uh, similar to the United Nations, which was called the League of Nations. The League of Nations also uh, employed the concept of collective security, but they failed. They failed in preventing the Second World War. Why did they fail? There are, can be several reasons, but one important reason was because the United States was not participating in the League of Nations. The United States was actually uh, one of the advocates of the League of Nations when they came into being in 1919. But the UN didn't, the United States didn't join the League of Nations, probably because the decision making of the League of Nations was by consensus. By consensus means that it's not even majority voting. Consensus means that unless everyone in the league agrees, they cannot make any decision. In that, in, in a way, everyone has veto power. You know, consensus system means that everyone has veto power. If one of, how many are here? Let's say one of 30 people here, if any of you doesn't agree, we cannot make any decision. 
That means everyone has a veto power. So that obviously didn't work. So the United Nations, learning from the lessons of the League of Nations, United Nations is based on decision making by a majority vote. So if you have half of more than half of you agree on something, we we can make decision. What is the problem of this system? Problem of this system is that countries, states are not all the same. Some states are more powerful. Some states have much more people, larger population. Some state has uh, more than 1 billion people. Some other state has only 30,000 people. Even though the UN is based on the concept of sovereign equality, meaning all states are equal, if everything is decided by majority voting and we don't recognize the power of uh, powerful countries or bigger countries, then what do you think will happen? They will not join the organization because this organization will make decisions against their interests. And these countries, big countries, don't want to be subject to decisions which are contrary to their interests. So they will not join then only small and medium-sized countries will join the UN. Then what is the point of having the United Nations if these uh, big countries are not there? So that's why they introduced these concepts of permanent membership and veto power. In the Security Council, uh, five countries have permanent mem membership and veto power. So if these five countries, any of these five countries don't agree on something, the Security Council cannot make decision. But this privilege is only applied to the Security Council, not Economic and Social Council, not Human Rights Council, because only the Security Council can make decisions binding on member states or other decisions by resolutions, decisions by General Assembly, Economic and Social Council or Human Rights Council are in nature recommendations. They are not binding. Only the Security Council can make binding decisions and that's why they made, they gave these privileges to five most powerful countries at that time. But this approach has a little problem. What kind of problem does it have? Five most powerful countries in the world in 1945, they remain powerful forever. Things change, right? Well, until today, as it happens, these five, five countries are the, also the five nuclear weapon states, so they coincide. But nobody designed it that way because in 1945, only the United States had uh, nuclear weapons. But later, the other four countries all acquired nuclear weapons. So, this, this uh, system has a, one problem I already told you. The most powerful countries in 1945 are not necessarily most powerful. 70 years later, 100 years later, 200 years later, things change. Then if we try to reflect international reality in the system of the UN so that these powerful countries can be part of the UN, then what do we do when things change and now Different countries, new countries, are powerful countries. So some countries believe that they are now new powers, so they should be added to the permanent membership. These countries are called G4, group of four. They are Japan, Germany, Brazil, and India. 
these countries think they are now new powers. So they should be given same privileges as was given to P5. P5 means permanent five. Who are permanent five? The United States, United Kingdom, France, China, and Russia. But country like uh, Korea, we are opposed to this uh, uh, idea of G4 because if things change and if you keep adding new powers to permanent membership, then you cannot do anything about the existing powers. So for example, if the current P5 who, ha who have privileges, if uh, any of them is no longer powerful, but can we take the privileges from the country? We cannot, because you cannot change UN Charter without agreement of all these five countries. So these five countries, even though they are no longer as powerful as uh, in 1945, they will not agree to amending the charter according to which they will, their privileges will be taken away. So the way I see it, when they did it in 1945, they overdid it. Overdid it meaning you should reflect realities in the system. That's, that makes sense. If you don't reflect realities, the powers will not participate in the UN. So you should recognize their influence and you need to give them certain privileges. But they overdid it. They give, gave them not, not just certain privileges, they gave them absolute power with which they can prevent any amendment of the charter. So that's the dilemma. And uh, the group of countries, including South Korea, we believe that um, adding new permanent members is not a good idea. Just look at the existing uh, P5, you know, unless they agree, we cannot do anything about the, the amendment of charter. If you keep adding new permanent members, then you are complicating the things further. So they, they wrote it in the stone in 1945. So we shouldn't write anything in the stone anymore. Because if you write something in the stone, you cannot change it. You need to break the stone, which is not desirable. You should write things in pencil so that you can erase it and when you need to change it, so that you can change it. So that's how I see it. So going back to your question, five countries having privileges, what you described as oligarchy, might not be fair, but the way I see it, it is necessary because you need to reflect international realities in the system, in the institution. But if you ask me, if the current system is uh, the right thing to do, I slightly disagree because like I said, I believe they overdid it. So they should seek more institutional, more uh, dur durable way of reflecting realities in the system. If you ask me what, what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of uh, improvement can be there, I don't want to go too far into it, but for example, in the European Union, some countries have more voting power than others. This is called weighted voting because they, they recognize that some member states in the European Union have more influence, so they should be given more power in making decisions. So that could be one way of doing it. Uh, and I have a Facebook question from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And the first question is, uh, and but this is in Korean, but I translate into English. Ambassador, you 
spoke last December uh, in the Security Council, and you said uh, people in the North, for South Koreans, people in the North are not just anybody's. Uh, my question is, why are you interested in North Korean human rights issue? Good question. Well, we, you know, I gave this uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation to give you better understanding of the UN's work and the background that led to the meeting on December 22, on North Korean human rights in the Security Council. I told you that uh, it is quite rare for the Security Council to deal with human rights issues because we have the Human Rights Council in Geneva. That's the proper places where you discuss North Korea, human, any human rights issues. But Security Council picks up a human rights issue only when it is so serious that it could pose a threat to international peace and security. In history, there have been only three such cases. Those were Zimbabwe, Myanmar, and DPRK. So North Korea became the third country in the world whose human rights case was brought to the Security Council. And that was also South Korea's last meeting, last official meeting in the Security Council. So that's why I thought I should share uh, some of my special thoughts and feelings. Not just me, I think all my country fellow men should have a special thoughts and feelings about this fact that the North Korean human rights issue was brought to the Security Council and because there have been serious human rights violations and those who are suffering from human rights violations are our sisters and brothers. So you, we cannot just say the same thing as other Security Council members, as if we have nothing to do with them. So that's why I spoke like that. The second question is uh, North Korean, why do we need to s try to settle North Korean issue through the United Nations? But this is also a good question. Um, basically, in the United Nations, there are three categories of North Korean issues. The first one is their WMD issues, because like I said, they are developing nuclear weapons and missiles. So these are called the WMD issues. And the reason, for the reason I already explained to you, this is threat to the global regime to prevent uh, proliferation of WMDs. So that's why it is a threat to the whole world, not just to South Korea. So that's why it should be dealt with in the UN. The second category of North Korean issue in the UN is human rights. Uh, again, like I said, if you have serious violations of human rights that will lead to a threat to international peace and security, just like the case of development when the fa founding fathers of the United Nations uh, drafted the UN Charter. I think they were very wise, wise people. Because even though the United Nations was a product of a post-global war settlement, these founding fathers thought that just talking about peace and security is not enough without people enjoying prosperity together without people enjoying human dignity together, peace and threat will be threatened again. So they, that's why they had the three pillars in the UN. They could have come up with just one pillar, peace and security, because that was the purpose of creating U UN in 1945. 
But they didn't do that. They came out with three pillars, development and human rights. Because without development and human rights, peace and security, peace and stability cannot be sustainable. That's what founding fathers of the United Nations believed. And that's why the, the North Korean issue, proliferation of WMD, human rights, all have to be dealt with in the UN. The third category of the North Korean issue is actually a little different. It is humanitarian issue, meaning even though North Korean government is doing a lot of wrong things, people in the North, when they are starving and when they are suffering, they should be given assistance by the international community and actually by South Korea also. We are, Republic of Korea is the largest humanitarian assistance provi provider to the DPRK, to North Korea. Last year alone, we provided about $20 million of assistance, humanitarian assistance to North Korea. All together, all assistance given to North Korea last year is probably less than $50 million. And $20 million was given by South Korea. That means at least 40% of all humanitarian assistance to North Korea came from South Korea. So even though North Korean government is doing a lot of wrong things, people in North Korea should be assisted because they are suffering, because they are starving. I think uh, after answering Facebook questions, um, I'm almost done. Uh, unless you have uh, one final question you definitely have to ask. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, it's an honor to be here to uh, listen to your remarkable speech. Uh, the categorized three concepts help me better understanding about the world and UN and the current Korean issues. Uh, so I want to ask one question, like last question. Absolutely. Uh, I think it is crucial to keep balance between administrative work to doing administrative work at the same time feel or sympathy about what are what you are doing what you dealing with the issue so i think uh you ambassador you are very uh keeping the balance well so how do you uh make the balance between the two like being a bureaucrat like not a just uh being bureaucrat but you, as a human being, you're working very balanced. Yeah. I see what, but the, the term you used as a administrative is not, uh, is not exactly the right word, but I get what you, what you are asking me about. Um, whatever you are doing in your future life, you know, even though you, you will never be a bureaucrat. You will never be a government official. You will never be a diplomat. Whatever you will be doing, you always have, sometimes have conflicts between your duty in your work and what you believe is right. It is uh, desirable if you are doing something for your work, you are doing something that is in line with your value. So you, you do something in your work, but that's very much in line with what you believe in. That's most desirable. But no matter what you are doing, it cannot 
happen like that every time, you know, even though sometimes even the, let's say you are working in a humanitarian organization and you strongly believe in humanitarianism, but in this organization, you might be sometimes have to be doing something that you don't think is very humanitarian, you know, even humanitarian organizations are not always doing things humanitarian. They also have a lot of mundane, they have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, bureaucratic problems like any other organizations. So in those cases, you necessarily have conflicts between your duty and between your conscience or between what you believe in. So I think her question is about how you balance it. Yeah, it's not an easy question. I would say that if you are asked to do something that is totally out of your value, that is totally unacceptable according to your value, then I think you shouldn't do that. But you will ask me what is totally, you know? So is it okay to do things that are a little in conflict with your value? Well, we are doing a lot of things that are a little in conflict with our value anyway, every day. So I cannot, you know, give you where you draw the line. You yourself draw the line. And I myself draw the line. So I said, when I spoke in the Security Council meeting on North Korea, I felt that I cannot repeat what other member states of the Security Council have already said, because North Korea is, is special to us. If I say the same thing as other members like Chile or Nigeria were saying, not that there is anything wrong with what they are saying. They were saying all the right things. But if I repeat the same thing and stop there, then what is the difference between South Korea and Nigeria and Chile in dealing with North Korea? Is, isn't North Korea special to us? Thank you.